before we get started, as, as Kayla mentioned, uh, for those who, who uh, joined us a little later, uh, you're definitely going to want a pen, paper, or sticky notes. Absolutely encouraged for, for today. It's going to be a lot more, or even more interactive than our, our last event, because uh, it's really, our goal is to today really get you to learn how to go through the design thinking process, or at least get introduced to it, I should say. Um, and we're going to do a little exercise where we try to apply it to the oceans and, uh, and see what we can come up with together. So it's going to be fun. And uh, you know, we're planning on having a lot of different events like these to really empower you with these skills and knowledge that you might not be uh, introduced to in your traditional career path or, or schooling. So um, it's something that both Vincent, Kayla, and I are, are all really excited about and, uh, and have been involved with almost in like a cult-like capacity for a long time. Uh, so it's, it's going to be really fun to, to dive in. So without further ado, uh, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our panel. So first off, we have Vincent Arena, who is a very good friend of mine and a co-founder of Tezetto and Catalyst. Vince, you want to say hi and give a little insight in your, your background real quick? Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Vincent. Um, I grew up on Long Island. Uh, that's where I am right now. And I went to school for Engineering and Design Innovation Society. So that crazy acronym is basically how to apply um, technology and specifically like engineering mindset towards solving social and environmental problems. And um, growing up on Long Island, uh, avid lover of the beach, I'm a surfer. Um, I definitely have a really big passion in the environment conservation. So that sort of led me towards sustainability and after school, I ended up partnering up with my dad, who um, was born in Italy, and we partnered with family there and created a little prototype cafe concept with the idea of creating a zero waste coffee shop. Um, what came out of that is now we have two locations. I'm in our like prototype location right now, just kind of like an office. And uh, we've been experimenting with different things like uh, we have an edible biscotti cup which is like a, a cookie in the shape of a cup where you can basically eat your, uh, drink your coffee or espresso and then eat the entire cup afterwards. Um, we also have gotten like the food waste in the establishment down to like under 2%. Um, and I've learned a lot through that whole process. But um, yeah, excited to talk more about that and some other projects I'm working on around sustainability and um, go through the design thinking process. Yeah, Vincent doesn't stop working. It's it's a very that's well actually the hilarious thing they didn't mention is he works in a coffee shop but he doesn't drink coffee himself. I don't know how he does it. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a great secret. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Kayla, you wanna you wanna talk a little bit about your 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 background? Sure. Hey everybody, I'm Kayla Barber. I drink a lot of coffee, <laughs> probably too much, but uh, I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm currently based in Cincinnati. I'm a first year grad student in the Master for Community Planning program here. And I did my undergrad at Berea and worked in the Office of Sustainability there. And uh, it really just opened my eyes to um, the, the cycle of use, um, you know, as far as buying things, using them, and just throwing them away. Um, and I was a technology and applied design major, so kind of similar to Vincent, less engineering probably, but very focused on how society interacts with technology and what we do with it when we're done. Um, so now I'm studying, like I said, community planning, hoping to impact zoning use, land use planning, um, rather than pointing a finger at everybody and saying, you're bad, you need to recycle. I think that we need to have community infrastructure and you know regulations to a point that support healthy growth. Um, definitely interested in water as well. I grew up on the Ohio River, uh, which is very polluted, um, lots of chemicals. At one point it burned, I think it was on fire for a few days in the 70s. Um, so, you know, and the trickle down effect, literally our rivers to the ocean has um, just motivated me to have a, you know, stay mindful of water and um, our relationship with it. So I was thrilled when Daniel asked me to participate. And uh, like Vincent, we're excited to show you the design thinking process. And we hope that you all gain some tools that you can use everywhere and at home and your career and your personal lives to um, just be more thoughtful and mindful about your everyday life. And, and I think the other thing too is just to give people ways to tap into their passions. And Kayla is one of the most passionate people I've ever met about sustainability in the environment. So excited to, to channel her energy on that as well. 
Uh, so as we said, one last reminder, warning, you know, have a pen and paper handy. We're, we're going to get busy here. All right. You're, I, I see someone's ready. That's Marty. There you go. Um, Kayla, you want to you wanna kick us off? Sure. So um, for those of you that don't know much about design thinking, it's an innovative process that basically is redefining how on the back end side of design, the, from the engineering perspective, uh, the producer's perspective, this is a way to get more intimate with the customer, um, a concept, human-centered design. Um, if you think about how technologies kind of evolved, you know, back when in the early industrial revolution, when the producers had all the control, there was one kind of button, one kind of wrench. And, you know, as more providers have emerged, customers have gotten more choice. And so design thinking is a way to really tap into problem solving. And if you think about it like a cycle, whereas previously things were designed very linearly, you know, it was just someone had an idea, they made a couple of prototypes and then they started producing it. And then you see things like recalls happening uh, or, you know, products that break and they're not, you know, really that useful. So design thinking emerged. Um, it was kind of this visionary David Kelly, who's a professor at Stanford University, and he founded the D School which by the way, we are affiliated with through the University Innovation Fellows Program. So this is um, a toolkit that we were shown and educated on and encouraged to give back and lead other workshops to help spread this kind of novel way of thinking. Uh, so anyways, it's a series of steps. You can go to the next slide if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so David Kelly, he's an innovator. Einstein, Tesla, all sorts of people with radical ideas, they have one thing in common. They're not afraid of new ideas. They want to challenge the status quo, the, like I said, redefine the linear way of thinking and have a new approach to being observant and being creative. So design thinking, we can think of as a series of steps. It's beginning with empathizing truly trying to identify what, what problems another person might have in their life. Then we kind of work into defining the issue, putting it into a statement, which we'll learn about here in a little bit, like a how might we. And then we ideate, which is the flaring part, um, where we think big, we cast a lot of ideas, and then we come back to focusing more, and we try to define again with a little more intention behind it and adding some constraints such as time, budget, uh, platform. And then lastly, we test, uh, which is, you know, again, uh, research or introducing surveys, design thinking in itself. And so those steps are just repeated and eventually the ideal solution is found and it's one that is inclusive, thoughtful, um, you know, well, documented and ideally beneficial for as many people as they can be. So I'm going to jump in here. As you guys might know, hopefully coming in here today, there are a lot of different problems facing the oceans and, you know, how we approach these problems can be a number of different ways, but applying the design thinking method to these problems can give us a totally different path to approaching them than traditional research, or you know, product-driven uh, solutions. And so basically you wanna use this kind of giant map and I don't expect you to memorize it, but use this as a little inspiration as we move forward in going through this process and, and hopefully coming up with some great examples. So the first step of the design thinking process is to identify problems. So using our pen and paper, we're gonna just think about, and I'll go back to the slide before this, but let's just start thinking about what problems facing the oceans uh, resonate with you? You know, what do you feel like are things that are a doable thing for us to tackle within our lifetimes? There is nothing that should be off the table. Everything is possible at this stage of the game. We're not trying to be critically realistic. We're trying to dream big and go big. That's why we're flaring out with, with our method here. So we're going to give us two minutes to just think about it, write a list, and we'll, we're going to end up sharing some stuff later, but we'll, we'll get to that point. So just Start by writing your own list of problems that you think are facing the oceans today that we can start working on solutions toward.
should have had music prepared for this <laughs> next time. And here I'll go back to the map so you guys can have some like, inspiration jumping off points there. And if you ever want to get this uh, this list, it's actually an interactive list. It's actually on the World Economic Forum's website. Vincent uh, turned me on to this. It's an amazing resource. Um, you can touch on it. I forgot the exact name, but I have it in my business plan. So, <laughs> called Strategic Intelligence by the World Economic Forum, and you can sign up to explore it. It's like an interactive mind map of problems. Yeah. Amazing resource. Try to give it one more minute, and we'll we'll, we'll jump on to the next part of the process. I just want to re reiterate, it's really a wide open field right now as far as how we approach these problems. Nothing's off the table, no problem is fully solved. You know, approach this with a completely open mind. And could you say one more time the name of this chart? Or do you have a URL for it? I'm going to post the URL in the chat for you. Thanks, Vincent. No problem. Oh, yeah, this is definitely of Jonathan's alley. <laughs> it might prompt you to create an account to view this, but this is the the form specifically for the oceans. All right, we're gonna keep going. So this is the part where we start to actually talk about what we thought about and, and get to know, you know what, what constitutes the problems that we consider important and why. And so empathy is a critical value, not only in just daily life these days, but especially when it comes to the design thinking process and innovation. It's more than just, oh, that's important and that's why it's important. It's actually getting behind the deeper meaning of why something's important to people on cultural levels, on personal levels, on, you know, ways that are more than just superficial, right? Um, so as we start to dive in here, what we're going to encourage you to do is for now, if you want to list some of the things that you consider problems in the chat, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go through and maybe call in a couple of you guys to, to share your, uh, you know, why you think it's, it's an important problem to, to solve. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to see if I can do, view the chat while screen sharing. There you go. Thanks, Marie. So we got the non-inclusive nature of aquaculture. That's interesting. I'll add mine as well. All right, give it one more minute and we'll we'll start talking. Ooh, that's a good one, Jeff. All right. How about Caleb and Kayla and Vincent, we'll, we'll, we'll each pick one, okay? That way there, okay. there's some democracy here. But we can't pick our own. Uh, <laughs> so um, how about Deepin? Do you want to talk about the non-inclusive nature of aquaculture? That's really interesting. Uh, by that I mean uh, aquaculture is usually a resource intensive enterprise and uh, people who are uh, usually at the bottom rung or do, who don't have enough resources, they are usually excluded uh, out of aquaculture. Like you need uh, to cross a certain uh, entry barrier or a threshold to get into aquaculture. That's so it's, it's like a socioeconomic barrier you're touching on. Yeah, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I um, work with a lot of marginal fishing communities in India, so this is uh, 
a problem which we regular we come across like the entry barrier is a bit high wow hmm. I know one person who's here that would love to jump off that, but I'm, 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 I'm going to, I can't pick favorites. So, uh, can, uh, Vincent, you want to pick the next one? Vincent, you want to, you want to pick the next one to talk? You still here? Yeah. So Jeff's uh, price per pixel, I actually don't know what that means. So I'm intrigued to, uh, <laughs> you could expand on that. Uh, I have a habit of, creating ambiguous buzz phrases. But the price per pixel is really just this concept that the ocean, to understand it, we need data. And whereas on land, we can like walk or drive somewhere to get data in the ocean. You, I mean, remote sensing, you can use a satellite. That's not cheap to put up there in the first place. But to, to really the, the cost in operator time, labor, ship time, fuel, all of that to really sometimes to just get a friggin' water sample is like, that's like a, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for a water sample, which is, which is really high. And again, to the point that Deepin made about uh, availability across different countries, there's, you know, it, it's prohibitive for a lot of, a lot, a lot of people to have access to that data or, or go get that themselves. So just how can we at a very high level, lower the cost of doing research in the oceans and, Selfishly, I think autonomous platforms are one way to do that, but I, I think there's a lot more ideation that can happen around that. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. I didn't know I didn't know much about the uh, pricing, but I'm sure it's a lot more expensive to send things underwater than <laughs> on the land. It's like almost space in terms of the difference. That's really uh, Kayla, you want to take the last one? Yeah, sure. And um, just building off what you were saying, um, Jeff, that I'm in a GIS class this semester. It's the first time I've used it. And initially, when you were talking about that, I was thinking some kind of mapping data. But I wonder if that's maybe something to explore a different way of analyzing it. Um, I'm really interested in what Marty had mentioned about sewage pollutants, dumping, nitrification, um, you know, my interest in community planning and how our infrastructure doesn't support the growth we have and how a lot of it has been based on profit and not necessarily our quality of life. Marty, would you like to talk about that some? The sewage pollutants and something and whatnot. Sure. Um, I guess, uh, just it's such a big deal here in Miami. Um, big part of the Biscayne issues, uh, whether it be coming from Lake Okeechobee and release of water into the Everglades and down into the Biscayne Bay, or whether it's just a uh, straight runoff from all the beautiful golf courses that South Florida has. Uh, you have a lot of communities built along not only the, the coast, but in the islands of uh, the Keys, and it's diminishing our, uh, our ocean resources and a lot of the living communities in the area because of the mass amounts of, I guess it's, it's not that they weren't already getting some of that naturally, but um, they're just getting flooded, they're getting overwhelmed, and there's not enough time for a lot of the ocean, the living ocean bodies to, to respond and adapt. And so, you know, I mean, it's, there are hot button talk topics here are the, the fish die offs and mm. um, the damage to coral reefs, but it's, you know, those are, those are things that I think are big everywhere. And going back to uh, areas that don't have the, the resources um, the financial resources, the scientific resources, whatever it is, for uh, better quality uh, of, of water and dumping into the oceans. But, you know, this is the United States and we're, this is a wealthy country with a wealthy Miami community and we're still running into those major problems right here. And uh, there's no, it doesn't look like it's going to get any better anytime soon. They are raising the roads down there, though. That's a great solution, isn't it? <laughs> we can just, instead of changing the structure, we can just change the structure. Yeah. 
Uh, well, yeah, and actually I was out <laughs> voting this morning with Marty for our, one of our, our classes and uh, we actually drove by the sewage release area in, my, in Biscayne Bay and it's actually right next door to uh, Fisher Island, which is the private island where former politicians live. Um, fun fact. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> more you know. Um, all right, moving along here. So thank you guys for sharing. And I know there were a bunch of other great points, uh, points there as well. There we go. Um, so selecting an opportunity. Vincent, you want to jump in on this? Vincent? You're muted. Oh, wow. All right. Well, that's a first. <laughs> I guess everyone has to do it once. So usually through empathizing with people, talking, having conversations, reading the news, we start to see trends and patterns that point us to specific opportunities and specific problems. And how I see it and how the design thinking method sees it is that problems are opportunities. Um, after I left Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I saw so many problems and I decided I could not take a full-time job because I wanted to devote myself to exploring all those opportunities. And the, the next slide is about making a how might be statement, which is basically a way to narrow down on the specific area that we're going to, to tackle. Um, and the interesting thing about this is start to think about different stakeholders. For example, in sustainability, um, do you think about the person who is buying coffee? Do you think about the cafe owner? Do you think about the manufacturers of product, policy makers? There are so many different points of intersection. And so now um, we're going to pick one of the problems that um, we narrowed down on that you guys post in the chat and write a how might we statement. So some examples, how might we help coffee shop owners make it easy for them to make sustainable decisions? How might we help people who want to create change connect to the opportunities and resources that can catalyze them into action? Those are two of the how might weaves that I've used to guide some of my projects. Maybe I'll call on Daniel and Kayla to give some examples of theirs as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll give see where these how might we right now. It was how might we uh, change the or change the systemic infrastructure for facilitating innovation for the oceans. Kayla, you got any? Kayla, are you muted too? <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, yes I was, sorry about that. Uh, right now I'm, I'm thinking about how we might help those involved, as Deepin was talking about um, with aquaculture, you know, on the small scale farmers, how might we help, um, you know, a targeted group of people like uh, small scale farmers in India involved in aquaculture to, and then I, I'm not sure what the barriers are, but whether um, you're talking about to, you know, help get political change or if it's some a resource that they need or um, that's something from the chat that I'm really interested in if we would you know, talk about that. But. And Vincent, I'm not, you, you tell me if it's kosher to jump ahead for a second, but I feel like a yes and is, is happening here. Um, and that's the next part of, of this. Um, is it okay if I jump ahead for a slide for a sec, Vincent? Yes, and that's totally great. <laughs> <laughs> You see why we get along. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so for to Kayla's point, it's it's a my my yes and which basically the, the idea here is that we're we're trying to promote there's no wrong idea or bad idea, right? We we're trying to embrace all ideas and of course some need iterations or add-ons. And so for Kayla's, I was going to yes and and say, yes, and how might we actually create a more universal understanding of what those barriers are to small scale aquaculture projects. Does somebody want to build off that with a yes and? <laughs> or, or, or open up for a how might we as well. Just go ahead and, and put it out there. So let's see, just a review of the ideas. We've got quite a few, it looks like, around laws and legality involving sea change. Um, a few related to extraction, it looks like, with mining and carbon capture. Um, 
we've got some plastic mention here. So the um, how might we statement, like Vincent was saying, is kind of our first step to actionizing, um, defining the plan. So here we're kind of doing a focus or a flare. I'm sorry, we're doing a flare where we're casting the net wide. Um, and so building off of the bugs that we identified in the chat a moment ago, we can kind of take take that a step further to think about, um, you know, an example like Vincent has, who are we helping in the coffee shop business? Is it, is it the owner or the customer? Well, here is the point where we might start to identify who actually needs the help. Is it the owners or is it the customers? So um, we can just take a few moments if you like and write a couple of these down and then uh, share it again here in a second. Yeah. And when you share it, you can feel free to unmute for, for sharing. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> also, you can feel free to abbreviate how might we as HMW, that's like a pretty common uh, design thinking acronym. Mm -hmm. I'm going to check the chat as well. I was actually going to say, Julie, I think this, this might be a great opportunity for you to build off of, of, of uh, deep ends, the yes and, with a yes and, or with a how might we. And I, I know Julie's in fisheries as well. There you go. <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> okay, so I was thinking about what I can remember his name. Deep end. Deep end, what Deep end was saying. And... I think that a way we can, or we may help this, um, let's call, I don't know if we can call them like small scale fishermen or small scale aquaculturists to start developing their, this aquaculture um, business, let's say. Um, I think it's the first thing maybe is just to know which are they like, which things they need there if maybe is there is a problem because they don't know how to do it or if there is a pro problem because they don't have the money to do it and they have the tools but they don't have like the monetary efficiency and maybe it's because the government are not helping them to improve this kind of aquaculture so i think the first step for this problem might be just to know the reality they are facing and maybe just like choose one of those um, reasons why this is going on. So if, if I were to translate that into our how might we, right? Like, so how might we better understand the financial impacts of, you know, government policy or, mm -hmm. uh, or, public, or public funding and private funding for the aquaculture sector in developing countries or even, even our country? I mean, the U.S. is responsible for less than 1% of global aquaculture. So it's, it's any country, really. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have one? I'm, I'm trying to morph it into the framework. Um, so it was definitely about the aquaculture as well. And I, I guess it was, I was framing it as how can we learn lessons from early deployments of solar where technology was paired with small scale financing. So there's lessons to be learned there. Like when solar was like, hey, great, people can put solar on their houses. Um, and then it was like, okay, how? You know, people don't have $30,000 sitting around. So it wasn't until the financial markets matured that that actually got implemented. Like, so how do I frame the question of, you know, how can we learn from those lessons for aquaculture and then apply it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like how, how might we take existing models for building up, you know, cleaner resource, cleaner resource, uh, clean resources, period, um, then, you know, and apply them to other fields, right? Yeah, yeah, that framework's there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. I would uh, plug Seaworthy and say that uh, building a community that, you know, brings people that have these great ideas that want to positively change the ocean uh, whether it is aquaculture or whether it is putting a bunch of glass up on your roof to try to save some energy, it's um, 
getting those dollars and that focus uh, of energy in the right place before it becomes an entrepreneurial uh, for big companies or for the government to decide how that's going to be handled. You can get it in the, the early stages, you know, you, that can be a, a more affordable and more practical and quicker form of aquaculture or whatever it is that, that we're tackling. So. And, and, and that's basically right. So how might we create these alternative paths to catalyze the work of solutions that aren't hopefully dependent on public funding or governance, right? Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of these, you know, are scalable as well. It's, you know, it sounds like we can impact just as easily at home, you know, as with a group. Um, and I think that's one of the powerful tools about the internet. I mean, like here we are, even just, sitting here and having a conversation about this is getting the balls rolling. And, um, you know, I think it's important for us to incorporate that too, as far as design thinking goes, um, with really just constantly thinking of the people that are impacted by our actions and how we can impact others. And so the how might we statement, um, sounds like a few of us are really interested in awful culture. And, you know, it'd be awesome to do that at home. I don't know the first thing about that aquaponics or something like that, maybe here in a landlocked state, but, um, you know, we could um, explore that a little further if you guys like, or did anyone else have any suggestions uh, for how might we, we're gonna kind of take this and expand on it in the next uh, couple slides of the exercise. So if you guys are cool with aquaculture, we could pick that and go with it. No objections? Okay. okay. Uh, all right, I'm gonna move on. But the last point I just wanted to add on, or maybe yes and, um, is also that this whole, how might we, right? We just it, we just had some global themes there, right? I mean, Deepin's talking about India, Julie, Julie's coming from, from Uruguay. Like the how might we is, is a very inclusive statement as well. And I think it's really powerful when you realize like that immediately you engage in a broader sense of thinking as far as beyond just your country's borders or your city's problems that these problems affect everyone everywhere and the sooner that we get you know this this diverse uh, collaboration the better ideas become as well all right Kayla I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you assuming this switches there we go so um it sounds like we kind of fleshed one out a little bit already um but so design thinking originated um, in the Silicon Valley, right? Stanford University, so very product oriented. So a lot of the design thinking exercise kind of prioritize prototyping with like physical materials and coming up with like the next best thing you can buy to solve the world's problems, right? So what I love about Daniel's idea for this is we're taking that a step further because we are ideating concepts, right? Behaviors, um, lifestyles, livelihoods. And so the form, if you see the top box, the form of our idea here, you know, it, it could range and vary, you know, deepen depending on some of the people that might take form as a physical good. It could be a service. Um, it could be an online platform. Uh, but here we're trying to kind of be little inventors and actually give a face to our idea. Um, so we identify the form and then uh, the function of that. Um, so is it something to overcome barriers and help people get, you know, in more contact with local governance? Or uh, is it to have, you know, an easier supply chain for something or an end of life cycle? And then we think of interactions as how we actually interact with this idea. Um, is this something I'm gonna do on my computer at home? Is this something I go somewhere else and do? Um, and so we're taking the how might we, and we're thinking about, okay, if we actually did this, like what would it look like? Uh, so we can take a few moments on this and, um, or talk about it as well, but uh, it's really helpful to write it down sometimes too, for following along. Kayla, you are absolutely right about this. In fact, I 
went ahead with naming my venture uh, aquatic livelihoods and the problem i tried to address in a way i tried to uh, make aquaculture inclusive by uh, miniaturizing it so what uh, i did uh, was instead of having a huge uh, 100 ton 200 ton aquaculture production systems i went uh, about designing uh, 200 300 kilogram production aquaculture system which these small uh, fishing communities can put in their own backyards so, oh wow that's awesome and and maybe even purchase much easier too you know something that's more accessible smaller sure, sure. yeah so uh, i uh, built a prototype for a low cost sensor kit so that uh, all the crucial uh, parameters of water quality parameters in aquaculture are taken care of like uh, when you uh, work with uh, unskilled uh, people who don't have much knowledge of how to uh, scientifically may, uh, take these readings then you have to automate certain processes so that uh, uh, there is less risk of failure right cheaper price per pixel maybe making that a little more accessible with the data and what not I appreciate you trying to connect the dots there, Kayla. It's it's definitely yeah, it's, it's, all it's, it's, I think. it's definitely different challenges, but I think there is def is also parallels, right? Because at the end of the day, even aquaculture, as as we're as it's a growing industry, is becoming a very data driven industry as well. Um, actually, Jeff and I both know a friend working over at Google X on a, a imaging AI driven imaging system for aquaculture, and they're trying to you know create this whole you know basically. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, yep. Jonathan, Jonathan does it as well. Um, but yeah, it's you know I think there there's we don't even realize some of the overlap between stuff on the small scale that deep deep end's touching on that is you know making this accessible and at the same time on the large scale making it smart and 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 something that we can actually learn from on a much deeper level. Um, so sorry, I, I got caught up in it, Kayla, but please feel free to get us back on track. <laughs> no, you're fine. So um, if you like, we guys, we can share a couple ideas since we've, um, we're kind of now on the focus stage. Um, so I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, design thinking is based on this like convergent, divergent theory where, um, because again, we're doing a cyclical process, right? We're constantly identifying or empathizing, ideating, testing, empathizing, ideating, identifying, testing. And so the, um, the flare focus is what helps fuel that creativity. So you cast the net wide, lots of ideas, kind of zoom in on an idea. So we're zooming in now, and from the last slide on the how might we statement around some kind of aquaculture. We know we wanna help small scale people have better access, have the tools they need. We know there's some barriers of entry um, with policy and access. And so now we're, um, we've got a couple ideas. Um, did anybody have a proposed solution, um, a form or a function interaction that they might like to share for that? I personally wrote one down. Um, a couple of years ago, I met this guy uh, who was working on um, this tree. It was, I don't know if you guys have seen him where you can grow like vegetables in your home and they have like all the lights around and you plug it in and you can like have your lettuce in the living room. Um, he was doing that for the public and he was doing it as like a public works project and trying to create a food forest um, in places experiencing drought. And it was taking like um, you know, moisture from the air to water the plants. And he kind of like had this neighborhood, residential, very community building type of project. And I immediately think of something like that when you're talking about in the backyard um, and aquaculture. And I'm thinking, you know, how, how might we empower, you know, small scale um, aquaculture in residential areas and the form, you know, for me would be some kind of like community platform. Would that be like a goodwill for aquaculture where a person could come to the store and buy something very inexpensively that they could use um, and donate it back when they're finished or maybe some kind of cooperative 
place where people could come and get educated and get some tools and maybe even get a little grant money. Um, so if, so thinking about that, what face a product might have or um, this collective. Anybody wanted to share or we could go, yeah, in a training center, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think um, I did actually skip a little part um, where we were supposed to take a few minutes and uh, do some brainstorming. So if you guys wanted to uh, take a couple seconds, sorry, got excited there. I, I yeah, tagged with the with the brainstorming. <laughs> Go ahead, Vincent. Sorry, I was breaking up a bit. Yeah, with the brainstorming. Um, so let's maybe take like a minute or two to do that. And definitely don't be afraid to be crazy. Um, we want obviously with brainstorming to suspend judgment, uh, like a quick story of, of how this is helpful. In the class I was in, um, we were trying to brainstorm around how to stop eggs from spoiling or going bad and having to throw them out. We're talking about food waste. And someone said, oh, what if you could un unspoil an egg? And uh, another student in the class raised their hand and said, oh, that's, are you kidding me? That's completely impossible. Like from a scientific perspective, like there's, that, that's just ridiculous. Why would you even propose that? Turns out a few months later, a New York Times article, scientists discovered how to unspoil an egg. And so suspending your judgment and your disbelief of crazy ideas um, is what can actually make those ideas come true because a lot of the, the biggest leaps have been things that nobody thought were possible. So that being said, um, go crazy, sketch, sketch it out, write it out, anything you guys need to do to get the creative juices flowing. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll, we'll uh, post those in the chat as, as they're coming into you. And Vincent Kelly, just to let you guys know, we're like five to 10 minutes more and then we'll, we'll, we'll gotta wrap up because it's 5.45 right now. I'll be watching the chat as well. <laughs> like that one, Vincent. Awesome. All right. I think, I think we might have reached our peak right there. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. 
Um, where, where do you guys want to start? There's, there's, been, there's a lot, a lot in the chat right now. This is great, including fish costumes. It's gonna be the new wave. <laughs> there's already a band called Fish. Sorry. There's this great precedent study you all should check out just real briefly in Lexington. It was um, an old rainbow bread factory. They closed down and became a brewery and they started an aquaponics unit in what was the oven. It was, it, you know, because the walls are like four feet thick, right? So they brew beer and then the leftover hops and barley mash and whatnot, they feed to the tilapia. And then they've got a restaurant on site where some of the little fishies end up but you know for the most part it's just the greens and the veggies and this whole beautiful system takes place within like 50 feet of each other uh it's called west six brewery they went up against magic hat a few years ago for a logo infringement and one you guys might remember them but the little guy came on top west six brewery if you're ever in lexington um the place is called food chain so that might be a cool thing to explore and ideate from I'm all for starting a brewery as well, but trying to <laughs> trying to stay on topic here. So, um, so yeah, so okay, I guess so. We've seen a lot in self sustainable beer compete. Okay, uh, don't don't get too wrapped up in the tangent. So, <laughs> although it's tempting, um, so yeah. So I mean, I think there's a lot here that we're seeing with with this micro aquaculture comp, uh, concept. Jonathan touched on it as well. Um, Jonathan, did you want to expand a little bit, and, and Jeff as well, if you'd like. Sure. Um, I mean, it's not too similar from what Kayla was saying, the idea of kind of like an all in one unit, but the thought is to look at areas that have water that might not otherwise be usable, whether it's brackish water from salt content or whether it's slightly polluted, um, not fully polluted, so more like a gray water environment. Um, find a way to get that water into an all in one um, aquaculture unit that includes both fish and, you know, plants and have that be community based where you deliver it in maybe uh, you know the half size shipping containers, so it's already ready for global transportation, and maybe have two financing models sitting on the side of that thing where people can either have microfinancing through um, traditional means, or it can be micro grants for people who are looking for impact investing at a small scale. Um, that's my that's what just was in my head. I don't know if that makes sense. It's awesome. Um... Yeah, <laughs> you're able to get a lot out in a very short amount of time. It's 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 great. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff, did you want to add anything before we, before we move on? I love the idea, Jonathan, about cooperative ownership. You know, a community resource that a localized group of people contribute to and benefit from. And you know, for me, I think that's really the only way whether it's like glass on the roof or not we've got to come together and have something that our community shares because uh, the resource their infrastructure just isn't supporting our needs like you said you know 100 percent, and it becomes a distributed model too so people are able to sustain it within the community we don't have the you know we're not shipping the resources other places you know we're not doing packaging it's just right there yeah and beautiful and and, 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 and view you know you can view it too which I've talked about before, but you know, the out of sight, out of mind thing, when you're actually right there engaged with it, the appreciation and the involvement is just so much better. And it builds community, which is great. Yeah, does. There's, there's a lot of different, uh, almost psychological aspects to it as well. It's, it's, it's all, all really good things to get the, the social side involved. Um, Kayla, I think we're going to have to move on because we're getting toward the end of our time here. Uh, anything else you wanted to add before we, before we get to our wrap up? Kayla? Um, hey, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Hey, um, I, I thought all those were excellent ideas. Um, I feel like you guys, hopefully you all understand kind of what we were wanting to go through with design thinking and the process. Um, and we do have this toolkit available online, um, you know, and it's published material. So this is, you know, free and accessible. Um, and we're hoping to do a little bit of a series. Uh, so we'd love some feedback. If you all want to join us, maybe we can do this once or twice a month and bring some friends and, um, and actually start, you know, working together, Seaworthy Collective, and uh, fleshing out some ideas. And who knows, maybe we'll have less six beer together next year after the virus or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like that line of thinking. Uh, so yeah, so along those lines, let's see if I can get the slideshow to go. Oh yeah, so we already did this. There we go. All right, so uh, to, to kind of put a wrap on everything. So, you know, where do we go from here, right? This is this is a kickoff of, of how we're going to have basically, as we had last week, kind of an inspiration event where we get people really interested in what's out there. And then these, I, I almost want to just reuse the term, flaring events, right, where we're really just you know, shooting out any and all ideas and not taking, there's no such thing as a wrong idea, but more importantly, that there are ways to approach problems and, and take on these uh, and come up with solutions that we realize, you know, we never would have thought of before. So with that, as Kayla mentioned, we're going to have more of these ideas for sea change workshops, for sure, uh, at least once a month, twice a month, we'll see, uh, <laughs> but at least once a month. Um, we're also planning on having a pitch competition later this year. So as you develop your ideas, we're hoping to actually have them featured and have hopefully a sponsor lined up to uh, to give you to have a prize involved. So that's in the works. Uh, and last but not least, it's never too soon to submit your own idea if you want to work with us on, on developing it and, and taking it along its path. Uh, we have our startups page on seaworthycollective.com. And that's just a little form you submit with a little blurb about your idea and we'll work to help you make it happen. Um, so otherwise, thank you all for coming today. Thank you to Vincent and Kayla. You guys have been awesome as always. And we have probably like five-ish minutes uh, for any questions you have. Feel free to unmute and ask. I mean, maybe, I'm, maybe I was cheating last night. I was doing some design thinking on my dock. I live on a sailboat. Um, one of the other boats are two people from IDEO. If you know the company IDEO that it sort of specializes in design thinking. And they're working on a project to ideate around remote surgery for space missions um, and like what that looks like. And so it got really fun after a number of beers. <laughs> yeah, David Kelly, um, who I believe founded Design Thinking, was you know one of the founders of IDEO. And they, so many little novel inventions in our everyday life that have, you know, like a better mouse. Uh, the new shopping cart. I mean, they've really come up with like quite a few things that we don't even recognize we have really. So I guess the question for Daniel and Seaworthy in general is like, how can you build that culture like at a base level into your organization, right? I mean, there's a lot of amazing things that have come out of that process and like almost like make it a requirement, you know, for people that come to get involved with you because, you know, there might be a case we made that these startups and the, the people you're trying to facilitate will have a greater likelihood of success if they embed these models early on in the culture of their company. Um, is that something you envision? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's why why we're here today, right? I mean, it's it's to present not only the the model of design thinking, right, but we also touched on the values as well. And I think that you know you can't you can't just say throw your ideas at us and we'll make it happen. It's it's there's there's not only a process but a culture behind it. And I mean, it's it, until I got introduced to the Innovation Fellows Program and met Vincent and Kayla through it, I didn't know how I'd ever approach it. And, you know, Seaworthy was born very much out of that approach. So uh, I really think it's important to, you know, it's, it's really just a source of empowerment more than anything to give people those, that ability to think beyond limitations and know that if they really actually take their shot, that it could take off. But step one is getting them in the place where they feel like they can take a shot and go for it. Well, um, I'm sure Daniel, you'll probably send out some information about the next time we're going to have a workshop. And um, like I said, give us some feedback. Um, we'd love to see some of y'all back and explore some of these issues more in depth. Yeah, absolutely. And and last thing, we have our beach cleanup on Saturday for those local to Miami. So if anyone wants to come, it's on our Seaworthy Events tab. It's a direct link to the United Way, uh, who's running the beach cleanup. Uh, and we'll be there Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, it's in Hall River Beach. So uh, feel free to check that out. That's seaworthycollective.com slash events. I'm seeing a couple things in the chat real quick just to make sure I didn't miss anything. But any last questions? Oh, and uh, thanks, Marty, for bringing that up as well. Um, I'm sure, Jonathan, you know as well, Peter Coughlin. Uh, he's actually one of the former partners at IDEO, and he's on our mentors uh, network as well. Uh, had a great conversation with him. And so he's... 
I'm happy to hopefully help facilitate something like this in the future as we get a little further along since he's, he's you know, far down the, the path of design thinking and beyond. So we'll be excited to leverage that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, any, any last questions, comments, concerns, puns? Um, Daniel, I'll send you some of the documentation from the cohort that I'm in at the Buckmeister Fuller Institute for Design. We're going through some stuff right now that touches on a lot of things you might like. Cool, that'd be great. And yeah, and then otherwise, you know, we're going to be coming out with, uh, oh, oh gosh, the chat's blown up. Uh, we're going to be coming out with, uh, with our schedule events for October, uh, probably late next week. Uh, we're going to be working on that. Uh, so Saturday is going to be our last event for September. Um, but yeah, keep a lookout. We'll be we'll be coming up with a whole slate of new events. We're actually thinking about having a community kind of get together, brainstorm discussion of just hearing more from your guys's end what you want out of this as well. So we'll we'll be putting that out there. Uh, looking forward to continuing the momentum we started this month, and hopefully see some of you at the beach cleanup on Saturday. Have a great one, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, Jeff. Y'all stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to stay here just to read the comments in the chat. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, me too. 100%. I, I wanted to see what this, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't open half the chats because I was like, I'm screen sharing. So I have a few minutes too if anyone wants to chat that's on. Okay, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn off the recording. Hold on.